We are like we are like Nick Saban of 2014 and 15. We are constantly evolving. Welcome to Fringe Element here on the 440 Sports Network. My name is Braden Gall, and you can follow me on Twitter at Braden Gall. And I'm Michael Bratton, SEC Mike on Twitter, host of that SEC podcast. Well, Mike, thanks for hanging out with us uh, this week on the show. Uh, Aaron getting a week off. We got Paul Feinbaum coming up a little bit later on in the program. Uh, I had about a 20-minute conversation with him. And uh, obviously, expansion news just just fluttering all over the internet, just 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 bathing in the the rumors in the twitter sewers as i like to do so we're, we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about ex, just expansion in general what would the sec what could they do what do they want to do what should they do what do we want them to do all the different angles around expansion i'll tell you why we're going to talk about that in a second and of course the number one player in the nation has announced that he's going at least committed to Georgia, whatever that means these days, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it it means much. He's already been a, committed to Ohio State and uh, you know close to Nebraska, but I think he'll stick with Georgia. But you know, I sit here and think about it, Braden. I mean, they just by God, they just won back to back national championships with a walk on quarterback that apparently never attended class. Uh, how are they going to do with the <laughs> nation's number one overall commit? Who? You know, some are saying is Justin Fields, Peyton Manning, and Trevor Lawrence rolled into one. I don't, I don't know. I, it must yeah, be well, good to be a dog. Yeah, yeah. Sa- save your takes on that one because I agree. With, I think I'm, I think I'm going to agree with you that that seems absurd. Uh, so we'll we'll touch on that in just a second. Um, of course, again, Paul Feynman coming up. We'll talk about the advent of his radio show, the beginning of his radio show. We're talking about the Nick Saban. When does Nick Saban retire? We'll talk about Kirby Smart in Georgia. Uh, a lot of football in there, a lot of radio, a lot of Paul media, a lot of Feinbaum show, a lot of callers, a lot of good stuff in there. So uh, we do appreciate his time. We'll talk to Paul a little bit later on. Um, all right. So the reason that this SEC expansion conversation is going to take place on this SEC product uh, is that there, there's still some saber rattling going on in these ACC meetings the main big brands in the ACC are very pissed off and they're not making as much money as everybody else, which is obviously what they've been saying for a long time. Uh, and it feels like there is now what, I don't know what they're calling it. The magnificent seven. I don't, I don't know what they're calling it. <laughs> um, but Clemson, Florida state, Miami, uh, Virginia, Virginia tech, NC state and North Carolina. I think that's seven. Uh, if they get to the, I suppose this is what, from the best I can understand, if they get to eight or nine, they can blow up the grant of rights there's an existential crisis for the teams that are left out. And then, of course, those seven or eight or nine teams are looking for homes. So I don't know how likely this is, Michael. It doesn't feel all that likely. It feels like it's still a lot of posturing to get leverage against the ACC. But certainly they're using the SEC and the lure of SEC money and stability and fame to try to bust up the ACC, which, of course, has probably been trying to happen for years now. I'm trying to figure out, Braden, which one of those is the magnificent one because I I can't think of one in there. Uh, maybe Florida State, maybe Clemson, because obviously what we're talking about is is football only, not basketball. As as great as some people may think that is, it it brings nothing to a television revenue standpoint. But uh, yeah, this is interesting to me in one regard, Braden, because. Clearly, I'm biased, but I think the SEC is uh, just on another level, even counting the Big Ten here. And I think the only way that the Big Ten ever catches up to the SEC, if that's even possible, is to reach into the Southeast, land a, a North Carolina, a Florida State, a Miami, um, a Clemson, and get into some of these footholds where the SEC is is already proclaimed its flag. And keeping the Big Ten out of the South, that is, I think that's got to be the highest of priorities for the SEC because I think that's the only thing that could potentially end their dominance. I think you're right on the field because like the Big Ten already makes more money in terms of TV because there's just more people that are alumni of those schools. And frankly, they're geographically a larger league. But on the field, like we, we talked about this last week on the show or two weeks ago, it's like what's left for the SEC to prove to people like they, they have more players drafted 17 years in a row. They've won like 16 out of 18 national championships. Uh, their attendance is number one in America. Like there's nothing else for the SEC to prove that it's not the best on the field. But I think you're right. I think there's a motivation here to continue to stabilize the conference um, in terms of moving forward. And Paul's actually going to allude to this. I'm going to ask him this question, which is like, should teams in the SEC be worried if we're going to, if the sport in the future is going to coalesce around big brands and not 
geography and like the conference. But I think you're you're right on the two most important like motivators here. Number one is is the SEC worried about the Big Ten coming down into our area, right? Um, to me, Virginia, North Carolina, Miami, Georgia Tech, those schools kind of walk, talk, and act like <laughs> like a Big Ten school. Um, and they play like it too, if you ask me. To to some degree, on on the football field, they certainly do. But uh, again. Uh, the Big Ten has this brand that they want to maintain that isn't about like just like they care a little bit more about things than just football. And the SEC doesn't even fake it like they're just like, yeah, we're the, we're the best <laughs> at football and don't give a shit about anything else. Um, I, I do think that people need to understand that North Carolina is the, the the number one prize in all of this, because the second you add a state to your footprint, you can charge millions of dollars more for the SEC network to be distributed. It automatically happens. There's no like negotiating. There's no, there's no contract. There's, it just happens. If they add Virginia tech and North Carolina, for example, they would automatically kick in huge chunks of revenue for the SEC. And it's why I've been saying this for a long time that both the big 10 and the SEC want the state of North Carolina and the state of Virginia. Those are their two priorities North Carolina is the best version of that for, for both states and for the SEC. Oh, by the way, they're both very good recruiting footprints for football as well uh, and attached geography, ge ge geographically. So I, I, don't, I, I see why you say what you say, Florida State, Clemson, but I think people need to understand. North Carolina, to me, I think is the SEC's top target. The question is, does North Carolina want to come to the SEC or the Big Ten? And I don't know that, that answer. Could you imagine, Braden, if the uh, home of the SEC network was surrounded by uh, Big Ten flags <laughs> up there? I mean, what a disgrace that would be. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine Charlotte being a, a Big Ten town, but uh, I guess, you know, we've seen stranger things with Los Angeles becoming part of their, their empire. Do, do you want – I mean, if you're going brands, it's – like, if, I, I don't think Miami's what – like, if you add Florida State, you're not going to go after Miami, I don't think. But what what about Clemson? Do, I mean, if you're talking big brands, it's just straight up Miami, Clemson, at North North Carolina, and Florida State. Is that not mm -hmm. saturating the Southeast to some degree, or are you doing it just to protect from the Big Ten? Um, I mean, I, yes and no, because I I just think these matchups. Imagine Texas versus Florida State, um, Clemson versus Oklahoma. I mean, the, and and that's. This is not a national championship I'm talking about, Braden. I'm talking week three matchup on <laughs> ABC. I mean, sign me up for that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I get it, North Carolina, Virginia, I could see uh, maybe even Virginia Tech. That'd be interesting to see, Braden, if uh, – imagine what if the SEC said something like, we'll take Virginia, but we don't want Virginia Tech, and then the Big Ten comes in and says, well, we'll take Virginia and Virginia Tech. Does that put pressure on lawmakers yeah. to say, hey, let's keep this rivalry – together even though rivalries be damned in, in college athletics nowadays but that could potentially be a trump card as well i know nc state nc state they don't hold much sway in anything but maybe we could say the same uh you know with north carolina making their decision maybe even duke couldn't imagine duke being a, a part of this but but i could certainly see uh the big 10 extending an offer to duke just just to uh keep that north carolina duke connection alive possibly but uh yeah, it, it, this is kind of fascinating, and I thought we were done with this, Braden. I thought no. I thought the next expansion we were going to get was San Diego State to the Pac-12. They're probably going to be talking about that four or five years from now when when North Carolina and and Texas are are playing in the SEC. Well, so again, I, the, man, I agree with a lot of what you're saying there. I think I think the Pac-12 is so, sort of on its own track here, and like whether that's S SMU, by the way, one of the best collectives already in all of college football from a G5 standpoint. So SMU and San Diego State are probably both headed to the they've Pac-12. They've had that since the 80s. <laughs> it's true. Headed to the Pac-12. Well done, sir. Uh, I, I think what's it like Virginia to me, I, I, I think it's a really valid point about the in-state like politics of it all. I mean, I asked Mike Gundy about that. It didn't have any effect on, <laughs> on Oklahoma, but that's Oklahoma. We're talking about the biggest brand. And frankly, I think, Duke, North Carolina, NC State are more attached to each other than Oklahoma or Oklahoma State were. I don't think the SEC wants Virginia. Like I, to me, Virginia is like adding another Missouri or Vanderbilt. No disrespect to Missouri, I think Missouri is actually probably a much better football program with a better fan base than Virginia 
but it's adding a very similar program to Vanderbilt. I don't think that moves the needle at all. Virginia Tech is has had far more football success, far bigger fan base, far more interesting brand for television, and gives you a foothold in that state. But I agree with you. I could see the Big Ten saying, "Look, North Carolina and, and Duke. If you if you want to come, we'll give you. We'll take Duke. Academic school, you know, all this stuff. They want to be down in there, into that area of the country." I don't think Duke does anything for the SEC. I don't. I think NC State actually, again, because you are allowed to leave the stadium, drink in the parking lot, and go back <laughs> into the stadium. That is as SEC as it gets, right there, baby. So I'm I'm actually all for bringing NC State into the SEC. I think they I think they would fit culturally because it's a little bit more football heavy, a little bit more blue collar. Like I just I just think they would fit in in the conference. Mm. Well, that's interesting. Well, I mean I mean I don't know how good this information is, Braden, but I, I used to work for national website Fox Sports and I managed newsletters and, and we send out newsletters uh, designed specifically for fan bases. And I just remember the ACC was uh, about as, as pathetic as it would get. I mean, I'm, NC State, Wake Forest, Duke, Virginia, I mean, all the, they're, they're basically irrelevant well, in terms of what we were putting out with the SEC in terms of readership. So that's always kind of stuck with me, and I've, I've always held it against those schools because I just don't see the fan support that we see in the SEC with a lot of those programs. So um, I, most of those I don't even think would be attractive short of what I said, just keeping the Big Ten out of that area. I, I will agree with you uh, that the vast majority of the ACC is full of those fan bases. You're, you're absolutely right. I think if you're bra- if you're trying to rank them, Clemson's probably number one. Florida State's probably number two, right? Those are the top two. And then I think I- I'd switch that. I think Florida State number okay. one. A- either way, they're both like from a from a pouring money into the facilities, attendance, uh, you know, trying to win championships. Those are the top two by a mile. Miami is clearly the third best football program, but their fans are interesting. It's like not as <laughs> it's not as like die hardish. The stadium's not even on campus. It's it's a little bit more there's a whole lot more going on in South Florida, but an elite recruiting base. So mm-hmm. there's clearly an appeal there for the big 10 and the sec. Um, it, Oh, by the way, let's mention this. Any, anybody that gets left out of this, uh, you know, musical chair thing that, that could, that could or could not happen in the future. It, they're all going to the big 12. <laughs> whoever's <laughs> left, whoever's left is going to the big 12. Um, but Louisville versus, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, Louisville's Baylor. perfect. L- yeah. Louisville, Louisville, that's a, they're, they're already packaged with West Virginia and Cincinnati. <laughs> they're already there. Again, this is what makes Virginia and North Carolina and Duke so, so much sense for the Big Ten. They already played against Maryland and all these teams. Like they have a relationship with those programs. Um, it just makes sense for them. Whereas the football teams in the South come into the, into the, into the SEC. What would you want? Like it, it, you can pick. Because, again, the fan, I think you're underselling. I would have Virginia Tech, NC State, North Carolina, and then maybe Louisville as, like, the next four fan bases in the ACC. And then I think there's a huge drop-off, like, just a plummet. You're putting uh, NC State over North Carolina? That's that's surprising. No, I'd go North Carolina as the biggest brand hmm. Well, in North, in North Carolina. Here's one thing you've not referenced, and maybe you're just staying away from this for obvious reasons, but uh, where does Notre Dame fit in all this? Because that's the ultimate one that I, I think everybody wants. And as <laughs> awful as Notre Dame and the SEC would be, um, I mean, I think they would take them over anybody. Yeah, a oh, million percent, yeah. And, and it and it gives you sort of like a big giant middle finger to the to the Big Ten. <laughs> and, to, and to the ACC, right? It's like, hey, fuck you. You, you didn't get him. We got the girl. Imagine the Gators playing at Notre Dame in early December. I mean, I just – how comical would that be? It would be great to watch. Come on. That would be great. Uh, now, here's the problem. It buys you a ton of money. It and it gives you that SEC network state footprint thing, but like it doesn't buy you a recruiting territory. Like you're not gonna Florida's not all of a sudden gonna start recruiting Indiana. <laughs> that's, not, that's not gonna that's not gonna happen. It it would be funny though if they had, you know, two five stars for some reason out of the blue and and Kirby comes up there and he's spending every week up there and they, they all go to Georgia. I mean, that that'd be that's the the deal with the devil Notre Dame would be making right there. Uh, Greg Oden and Mike Conley now playing for Kirby Smart at uh, at Georgia. <laughs> uh, I I do think North Carolina is the number one uh, prize for both conferences. 
I do agree with you that the Big Ten wants to come down and get football teams that are valuable, but not sacrifice their academic status because it's a little bit self. It's a little bit of their own status. Like it's not they could take Florida State and Clemson if they wanted to, but they're kind of like, no, we're better at school than that. And like that's why they don't win any football championships. Um, That's why I think it's Miami. That's why I think they want Miami and maybe Georgia Tech would be a really good move for the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. And not, and it would mean nothing to the SEC. Georgia Tech means nothing to the SEC, but it could mean a lot to the to the Big Ten. What would happen to Florida State and a Clemson in a scenario like that? Because I I would imagine South Carolina and Florida. I mean, obviously they don't they don't want those schools in the SEC. Would they just have to go independent or something? I guess there's a chance they could go independent. Um, start. I couldn't own. see. The, I don't see why they would join like the Big Twelve or something. I don't. I don't think that would benefit them. Uh, it would be a significant upgrade from the ACC. I think that's the key. Like, but but don't you do this knowing where you're going to end up? Right, right, but I mean, if the SEC doesn't want them, and you're saying the Big Ten doesn't want them, no, no. I, I, what I mean is, is you don't vote to blow up the ACC grant of rights without knowing where you're you're going to land. You know, like you've got that phone call. To, to, to Greg Sankey, maybe it's a, a burner phone and you're texting him and you're like, hey, I was just uh, about to say, Braden, I believe everything you're referencing is quite illegal and would never happen. <laughs> it's quite, super illegal. I, I just think that there's, there's, there's the seven schools plus like one more, whether it's Georgia tech or Louisville. I, I think Louisville's destined for the big 12. I think you're right. <laughs> That's where they're going. The big, Ten, the big 10 doesn't want them. The sec doesn't want them. I could see the big 10 taking Miami, Georgia tech, like, Virginia and North Carolina Mm -hmm. and then the SEC going okay we'll take Florida State Clemson NC State and Virginia Tech which are the four best football programs outside of maybe Miami in the conference and I and I think the Big Ten gets in its own way in that point at that point because they won't accept they won't take like you know (laughs) (laughs) the all girls the all girls school from Tallahassee they won't take that one (laughs) how many teams is too many I mean is is 20 too many? Is 24 too many? I think that's another question that has to be considered. Well, what's your answer? I mean, it, this this takes them to 20. Both both conferences. And then, and then, of course, you've got Oregon and Washington for the Big Ten potentially as well. I feel like 16 is pushing it. They, can't, they won't even play nine SEC games. I mean, I, what are we going to do with 20? I mean, we're going we're gonna to pl- not play half the league for three or four years. I, I, I feel like 16 is – is almost pushing the limit. Don't, but don't you think the? I mean, I obviously, yeah, like twelve would be perfect, um, or even ten would be perfect. I, I think, don't you think though, in ten years that like the the, this is gonna sound weird on an SEC podcast, but like that the phrase SEC just doesn't, it, it just means less. <laughs> like, because I, I mean, because it's not gonna like again. I'm gonna ask Paul this question, and he said, if you're a Missouri fan or a Kentucky fan or a Vanderbilt fan you should be concerned about being left out of the next round of like wherever the sport coalesces, it's going to coalesce mm-hmm. around big brands and Missouri doesn't drive TV ratings. Vanderbilt doesn't drive TV ratings. Uh, Arkansas and South Carolina and Ole Miss, they kind of do. Mississippi state kind of does Kentucky. Ah, uh, maybe a very good program, but do they on a national level? I don't know. Not over Florida state, not over Clemson. Right. But I I think the line that we draw around the SEC and put the border on it, I don't think that border matters anymore in 2035. Does that make sense? It sounds like you're trying to get me to shit on half my audience, and I'm not going to do it, Braden. No. Because th- these programs are, are special. They're unique, and they belong in the SEC. I just, I'm just wondering. I think we're putting the cart before the horse. Like th- These are important questions that need to be considered uh, before we just pick 12 of the best programs in the country and, and put them glue them together in a new thing and call it the sec I, th- I think history tradition all that is very very important and without it i don't think this sport is is what it is i i agree one million percent with you but you know who doesn't care about any of that they're tv people people that make fucking millions of dollars on this stuff <laughs> they don't care so yeah. I I agree with you. Otherwise, we wouldn't have broken up Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. Like that's it, you know. Right. Te- right. Texas and Texas A and M would never have left each other if, mm-hmm. if if that's the stuff that get that makes money. I well, don't think it's I don't think it's twelve teams though. I think it's forty five, and I think there's a Northern Conference and a Southern Conference. <laughs> <laughs> 
and we and we call the playoff the Civil War. I think it'd be great. <laughs> oh no! Oh man, yeah, that that's. I mean, I get you, you could be right, but uh, I'm I'm honestly I'm terrified of that. The good news is, is I don't think it's happening. I don't think this. I think this ACC stuff is a lot of posturing, mm-hmm. and I don't think we actually have this type of like upheaval until like 2032. So we've got the the new version of the playoff, the new version of the SEC. I think is going to be in place for about 10 years, and then you better be ready, dude. If you're not ready, you better be ready for. The Big Ten media rights come up. The Big 12 media rights come up. The SEC's media rights come up. The ACC grant of rights run out. 2032, 2033, we're going to have a totally different sport. And I don't know what that's going to look like. But let, let me ask you this, though, real quick. So Texas and Oklahoma obviously come into the SEC. Let's just say every team you just referenced, let's say they all go to the Big Ten. North Carolina, Clemson, Florida State, all this, all those garbage teams. That's still going to be a weaker league in my mind than a 16 team SEC with Texas and Oklahoma. I still don't think the Big Ten can compete. So I don't care if they got 35 teams. Um, it's it's going to be, you know, three great programs and 30 crappy ones. And in the SEC, we're going to have 16, 12 of which will be in contention for the college football playoff year in and year out. All right. So you're telling me that you think Ole Miss is a better program than Clemson? I think uh, I love you, I, Ole Miss fans. But even Ole Miss fans don't think that, right? But uh, but they're certainly better than all the other ones you said. No, but if you go Ohio, all the Virginias, all the North Carolina, oh yeah, 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 Wake yeah, yeah. Force, Duke, yeah, 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 all, all yeah. that, and yeah. I think the vast majority of the Big Ten too. If but if you, what I'm saying is is that there's a there's a there's a top half of the SEC that wins national championships, mm-hmm. bottom half doesn't. And they're great programs, great fan bases, love those programs, love those rivalries, love everything about them, but they don't win national championships in large part because they're in a very difficult conference. But if right. you told if you told me the top half of the Big Ten was Clemson, Florida State, Miami, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, USC, Nebraska, Wisconsin, like there, that is a lot of teams that could compete for national championships. And Arkansas hasn't done that I don't since think so. before integration. I don't think so. How, how many big how many national championships Big Ten win? They, it, Ohio State won in 2014. Michigan split one in 97. Is Am I forgetting one in my lifetime? I mean, they just don't win it, Braden. And I guess you could throw Clemson and Florida State in there, but uh, I think with with Southern Cal and UCLA going to the Big Ten, people think that's a coup. Well, good luck. Good luck signing up these guys to say, oh, yeah, you're going to spend half your season on an eight-hour flight. We're going to do this six times a season. I mean, I, I think that's going to kill them. I really do. I think that was a, a terrible, terrible mistake. And it, it was a reaction to Texas and Oklahoma, Oklahoma coming into the SEC. They had to make That's the true. move, but it's going to be a nightmare for travel. And I, I don't know. I, I just don't think you're going to get many prospects to sign up for that when they come to the SEC. And when Texas and Oklahoma come in, I think that elevates Ole Miss, Mississippi State, because those programs at, at times lose recruiting battles to a Iowa State, to a Baylor, to an Oklahoma State. I don't think that's happening anymore because this is essentially oh, mini NFL. So I think I think the the rising tide lifts all the ships in the SEC. And again, I'm a big homer, so that's a homer take. But uh, I really do think that's going to happen. I, I don't think it's a wrong take. I think it is a homer take, but it's not wrong. I, I think I, I think that the twelfth, no matter how many teams have been in the SEC, whether it was pre 1992, post 1992, before after A and M in Missouri or in this new one with Texas and Oklahoma, no matter how many teams, whether it's 10, 12, 14, 16, whatever the number is, I think the 12th place team in the SEC is better than everyone else's 12th place team. I think everyone else likes to say, oh, the SEC is just better at the top. That's that's not true. That's also true. But the SEC is better at the top. They're better in the middle. They're better at the bottom. They always have been. Mississippi State is probably, in the old SEC, Mississippi State might be the 13th best job in the conference. Maybe the... 12th best job in the conference that is the oldest stadium in the history of college football one of the loudest 60,000 seat stadiums you'll ever go to and they were number one in the country in 2014 (laughs) so there's no other program that is 12th or 13th in the big 10 or the ACC or any other conference that has that level of commitment passion fandom success tradition whatever so I am not arguing that part with you I am saying that the only thing the big 10 can do 
to your point, to try to try to gain ground on the SEC on the field is to go get USC, a team that wins national championships during the during your lifetime, to go get Clemson and Florida State, two teams that have won national championships during your lifetime, to go get Nebraska that has won multiple national championships during your lifetime, and to put them all together and then trim the fat on the bottom. Cut Rutgers and <laughs> cut yeah. Rutgers and Indiana and Northwestern out of the league altogether. That's their best chance. Well, it seems to have ruined Nebraska. Like it, like I'm saying, it may ruin Southern Cal, which I've lived out there too. Those those fans are horrible, Braden. I mean, you you think Vanderbilt fans are bad? Wait till <laughs> wait till you see Southern Cal line up for these uh, Rutgers Maryland football games. They they're not going to show up for it. Is is A and M and Nebraska all that different? Hmm. I mean, I think so. I sure as hell don't think Nebraska could ever beaten Nick Saban. I, not not while he's at Alabama, you know. And, no, and hell, no, they've nearly done it t- twice in a row. And they're recruiting. Uh, yeah, they're in a much better footprint as well for recruiting. And they got that oil money down. I don't think they they got that corn money up in Nebraska. So hey, Nebraska. Oh yeah. I, ne- if if Texas A and M had a qualified coach, they they would be in the college football playoff. All right, so that's what that's what I mean. If you put Nick Saban at Nebraska and Nick mm-hmm. Saban at A and M, don't they win about the same amount in both no, jobs? No, I think I think A and M would be a dynasty, and I think Nebraska would be uh, what Iowa is, like Capital One Bowl it, it, on a good think, year. You don't think Nick Saban could get them? I mean, they won three national titles in the '90s, so. Well, he okay, left right, Michigan right. State for that same reason, you know? No, I, I agree. I agree. He got his ass whooped by LSU and said, I got to get these guys <laughs> on the team. Well, and Michigan State's not quite the same. Uh, you know, they're they're in that Minnesota category that won national championships <laughs> in the 60s. Uh, but that's the last time That's the last time they sniffed anything close to that. Uh, either way, I, I I don't know about you. Do you just do – you, I don't like the cultural degradation of, like, the, the conference brands – like if you're a Big Ten fan or an SEC fan or like I like that's a part of what makes college football special. I don't mm-hmm. like that part, but I am I'm not gonna lie. I am obsessed with like the, the like the red string on the wall. Like oh, could North if North Carolina goes here, then this team goes here, and then that team goes here. <laughs> I, I'm obsessed with that stuff. I love it. It's like catnip to me because I well, could. It's it's fun because it's new and it's exciting, and that's what we thought when Nebraska jumped to the Big Ten when when Colorado makes these moves and then it just ruins their program even to an extent you could say Missouri moving to the SEC because they cut themselves off from that Texas pipeline and I I think you could argue they've not recovered since then so I mean it's exciting it's new but is it the best for their programs I think the answer um, is no I mean I can't think of realignment that has really helped many programs short of uh you know a and m a little bit and we're sitting here saying well how good are they really yeah. you, you utah know? utah tcu for sure mm-hmm. uh those two have both had huge huge benefits um but but i think you're right it, it does degrade like the culture of the sport the fabric of the sport i just think people need to be prepared for like a 45 team breakaway that maybe doesn't include even the teams at the bottom of the Big Ten and the SEC. So again, I'll ask uh, I'll ask Paul about that here coming up in just a second. Quickly, some actual news, uh, Michael, on the show. Uh, Dylan Raiola, of course, commits to Georgia, the number one player in the country. His father, speaking of Nebraska, his father was Dominic Raiola, who is a all-world everything uh, offensive lineman at, at Nebraska. He former commit to, to Ohio State. He decommits. Uh, really, the only takeaway I have, first of all, just Kirby's on an absolute tear. But like, the the SEC and the Big Ten to some degree, strangely enough, they have been going out to the West Coast and stealing their dudes forever. And until that stops, like Nico Iamaleava, number two quarterback in the country, goes to goes to Tennessee. You got Bryce Young. You got mm-hmm. you know all these guys from out west. Tua. You got r- right now the number one and number two quarterbacks. Matt Corral. Matt Corral. Yeah, the number one and number two quarterbacks in the country coming out a few years ago were Spencer Rattler and Jaden Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> Rattler, obviously Oklahoma, future SEC school, now at South Carolina. And, of course, Daniels did go to Arizona State technically. But uh, I don't know if there's a whole big story here. I mean, how about this one? If Tyler Buckner is the starting quarterback at Alabama, top 10 quarterback out of California. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you went there, uh, Brayden, because, I mean, Mike Bobo, 
not by me, but by many Alabama fans. I mean, they mocked that hire. They just landed the number one overall prospect. M- meanwhile, they're doing laps because they landed Tommy Reese, and that now they got Buckner. So, I mean, the decline of Nick Saban's dynasty, if you, if you needed any more evidence, there you go. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's almost laughable. And, and lost in the shuffle of, of Dylan Riola committing to Georgia, they already had a top-10 quarterback committed. So now they got two just yep. in case – you know, let, let's not hope he fails, but about half of these five-star prospects don't live up to the hype. Well, they got another guy that could live up to the hype potentially if he fails. And I, this is big also, Braden, because they tried to get Arch Manning. I, I believe they were runner-up yep. to Arch Manning. Yep. Had they struck out again two cycles in a row, that, that would have been a bad look, I feel like. And, and for all the success Georgia has had, I don't know, because I've seen a lot of this after he's committed. You know, he wants to go down there. He wants to get to the NFL. I'm struggling to think of what quarterbacks Georgia develops short of Matt Stafford. And I guess you could say Stetson, but they tried to replace him about three or four times. So <laughs> I, I, I don't even think they had well, confidence Justin, in him. Justin Fields would count as a quarterback who came out of high school, big time prospect, number one in the nation, signs with Georgia and is now starting in the NFL. Wherever he landed. <laughs> <laughs> well, because he went to Ohio State, that's Ohio. why. Well, but Ohio State's not known for – like, their whole joke is, like, they can't develop a quarterback, right? Like, that's the yeah. joke about Ohio State. Um, <laughs> I, I'm Listen, if you want to be worried about Kirby, you can play that role on the show. I'm not worried about Kirby. Now, I do think Bama was in for both Raiola and Arch Manning, and mm-hmm. Bama missed on both of them. I, I want you to go one step further on the demise of the Alabama dynasty. I'm not ready to do that yet. I do think Georgia is the better program, obviously, right now, but – uh, you, you think this is a permanent downward trend for Nick Saban? And then he's because I'm going to ask Paul about this. What, what's going to drive Nick Saban to retire? I want you to tell me you, you think this is it. This is the actual decline here. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's been evident since uh, Clemson put up what was it like 45, 48 points on him in the national championship game. From that point on, I, you know, I, I could see the difference there. And anytime they face a roster with comparable talent, and a solid quarterback, which is not often because they have such a good roster. They can't slow it down. And, hell, half the time they can't, they can't stop it at all. So this was, you know, the greatest dynasty of, in college football history, in my opinion. But uh, we're seeing Kirby be able to slow these guys down, and we're just not seeing it. And they could blame all that on Pete Golding. He's gone now. We'll see, they'll blame it on Kevin Steele this next season when, when Josh Heupel torches him, when Quinn Ewers torches him. We'll see. All the excuses are going to continue. Oh, I and love this. This is not to say that Alabama is some garbage program. I mean, they'll probably go 10-2, and two, something like I mean, that's a great record for anybody in the SEC, but it's not the gold standard that Alabama has been. And, uh, I mean, I think it's clear as day. I mean, they got five quarterbacks on the roster. They don't have a capable starter. Um, they, they don't have a Derrick Henry. They don't have a Lane Kiffin. This, this is trending dangerously, okay. and, and it's, it, it's been that way for a while now. I think you make a very compelling point. I do think, to your point about that Trevor Lawrence loss, they did win the national championship game by going undefeated the very next year. So even right, since but that was a COVID point. year. I don't think they tested for COVID down there in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> They had no one short of Nick they Saban. Had like, they had like Lisa. seven NFL players on in just the wide receiver core alone. They were loaded. Right. And and remember that season, Braden. I mean, like if if Georgia lost a game, half their guys would would uh, COVID out, whatever you want to call it. LSU yeah. the same. I mean, it was across the sport. Once a, once you started losing games, players were done. They were out. And when you kept winning, you keep those guys engaged. A and M same way. Fair enough. That, Fair that's enough. why I don't credit Jimbo for that great season, and and Alabama was great that year. I'll give him it, but no, I don't. I I, really, I basically don't count that as there was no fans in the stands. Come on, Dan Mullen <laughs> got to the SEC championship that year. That that year didn't count. I, I will say there's certainly an asterisk there. There's no question about that. But um, I, I I think I, here's what I would say: be be careful what you say about. You know, putting putting pouring dirt on Nick Saban's grave in in a football sense is a, a very dangerous habit that that many 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 people have tried over the years, um, and it hasn't hasn't really worked. Uh, with that in mind, <laughs> uh, the guy who basically put Alabama and Auburn together in the early '90s and just rode the wave to meteoric stardom. Uh, here was my conversation with the great Paul Feinbaum. Paul, good to have you on the show, man. How are you, sir? Uh, we're do- I'm doing great, Brayden. It's such a pleasure to be on. Thank you. 
Uh, I want to start. We'll talk a little football. We'll talk a little radio. We'll talk some some media today. But I wanted to ask you first, just in general, this time of year, I cannot remember a time in which all 14 SEC fan bases were fairly happy. Um, that gives me pause for concern uh, this season. But can you can you remember a time in which everybody was was this optimistic heading into a football season? It is it is weird uh, because you know sometimes you you have fan bases that are spiraling. Probably the the one I might put the most alarm on would be Florida, uh, but but you could say that any 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 year uh, in the last five or six. So uh, I think fan, Florida fans to, to to their credit are trying to be upbeat at least versus being despondent. I, you know, Napier obviously is a, we, we know his backstory. He has tried to replicate what Saban is, has done over his career. Mel Tucker, we, we know the list. It's very long. Um, and, and some places very distinguished. What, 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 what is it about Kirby smart that has allowed him to replicate the Nick Saban thing? Like what, why is he doing it where others have not been able to? I think in some ways, because uh, he, he is Nick Saban jr. Nick Saban 2.0, whatever, whatever tired cliche you would like to use. Um, <laughs> did I just lose you? No, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It's about, I'm Paul, sorry. it's about attention to detail, Paul. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I apologize. I was, I was trying to, to uh, maneuver something on the zoom. And I, yeah, you, you, I'm sitting in a, in a, in a highly, uh, technological television studio. You think I, I, I could do something right, but back to your, back to the answer. Uh, Kirby Smart 2.0. I, I just think that he is he 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 understands the Saban system so well. He has studied it so well. Uh, he's mastered it. And you, you know, it's a cliche that you hear every day when you talk to uh, somebody covering the SEC that what Nick Saban had at Alabama is now over at Georgia. Well, and I think I, I'm curious what you think, how and why Saban will eventually walk away because it feels like the thing that drives him is sort of like that meeting by meeting perfection, like minute to minute of his day, I am going to be perfect at this. Whatever I'm doing right now, I'm going to be perfect at it. And I, I think, I don't know if it's his own standards that will kind of push him away from the game, just family, maybe winning another champion. I don't know. what, what, How and why do you think Nick Saban ends up eventually retiring? Uh, I think it will come down to not winning. Um, I don't. He's got a, He's got everything in his DNA that that can handle every available issue except being second. He that that's not that's not him. Uh, he hates it. And I why I mean I've been there from the beginning, and I, I even covered him some at LSU. So I, you look for any little sign. Uh, is he changing? And uh, the one thing that I, I'll say that uh, I don't even think it's come out yet, but it's it's going to come out this week. Uh, is that he's out of the country. Uh, and I can never remember a time during Nick Saban's tenure at Alabama where he's ever done anything uh, other than, you know, maybe be gone for a weekend. Uh, I am told uh, that he and his family are in Italy for a 10 to 14 day trip. And the only reason I even know that is that we're, we cover the, uh, the golf tournament every year in, in Birmingham, the region tradition. And, he is not going to be there. So Wednesday, I don't know what day this comes out, um, but Wednesday of this week, it, it, it's going to get out that he's, <laughs> that something is terribly wrong in Tideland <laughs> that Nick Saban is missing in action. And I don't know what people are going to draw into that. Maybe maybe uh, his acolytes will say he's, he's over in Italy looking for a quarterback. Um, <laughs> but not, back to your original question, uh, Brayden, I – I, 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 I think he loves it. I think he, he loves the grind. And I think right now he's probably trying to convince himself that we're the underdog and we're going to get back on top. But if he fails to do that, then I think he's got issues, not us, but him. I, I can already see the, uh, the headline, like uh, Nick Saban, overly confident in team in 2023 question mark. Uh, it's why he's, it's why he's traveling. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, somebody snapped a picture of Saban, like, you know, with a piece of pizza uh, and behind him is a leaning tower of pizza. Uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, and, and maybe I'm all wrong about that. Maybe he changed his mind at the last minute and is really on a recruiting mission, but that's what <laughs> I was told, so I'll I'll stick with it. Uh, nice, a nice glass of cab in his hand. Uh, Miss Terry's yeah. hanging out there. It's going to be good. Um, 
So I think there's a there's obviously this all this change that's happening in, in college football. We're you know we, we got expansion, we got playoff, we got NIL, we got portal. I think it's all going to kind of level set eventually. We're all going to kind of get used to the new norm. But then we've got a round of renegotiations of media rights for every conference coming up in the 2030s, 2031, 2032, whenever you know you think that number might be. The Big Ten's going to come up. The SEC's got a chance to to come up as well. There there is a concern or at least some whispering that the the next coalition in college football is going to be around the biggest brands, the biggest fan bases, and not necessarily around geography or conferences even. Do, do you have any concern that there are some SEC programs that if this thing turns into a 40 or 45 team breakaway, that all of a sudden it's not SEC Big Ten, that it's biggest brands in college football versus the ones that do not draw from a TV rating standpoint? I think you have to be, uh, and you know, not to you know, not to go back to, uh, you know, Great, great quotes from history, but survival of the fittest does describe the SEC. And and I think if you're at the bottom, uh, this is going to affect you. I, I think it already is. Um, I think there are other leagues in worse shape, uh, but, you know, teams in other leagues that are in 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 worse shape than 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 we are. But but ultimately, if if you're Missouri, for instance, uh, and you can't seem to get over the top. How are you able going? How are you able ever able going to be able to do that when when everyone else is getting better? So yeah, there, there's legitimate concerns. I should have just said yes to your question about three <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> well, and I should have asked an open ended one. Um, Kentucky's the one that is like concerned. Like that's the weird one for me because the basketball product is so valuable, so entrenched in the league. It's such an important product. We've seen what investment and patience can actually do for the football program with Mark Stoops. But is is Kentucky going to move the needle in a in a in a media deal from a football standpoint? I don't know. Uh, the way I hear it, uh, I work at a television network. I don't have anything to do with the operation of it. Uh, basketball just doesn't matter very much. Uh -huh. uh, and we've seen that now for 10, 12 years now. Remember when the Big 12 was uh, on the verge of going to the Pac-10, 12, 14, whatever it is? They were leaving Kansas home. I mean, you tell me. Kansas, Kentucky, Duke, North Carolina, about the most valuable – basketball brands in the world and they didn't care uh I mean, yeah. every day you, you read another headline writing about the acc acc meeting complaints about financials okay well i, mean, I realize the acc is not as good in basketball as it has been but it's still pretty valuable and uh you hear the commissioner of the acc talking about football and so football drives everything right now I, i'd be i'd be curious um in terms of gambling uh, I'm curious if you think that we are safer now. Obviously, we have the whole thing with the Alabama situation where in a matter of like less than five days, we go from flagging something in the, in Vegas to a bet placed in Ohio with a game in Louisiana and a coach in Alabama gets fired. Like it, I, I know that, that college football games are flagged by the same business in Vegas. They're managing and monitoring this stuff like in, in like computer AI warp speed. Are you less or more concerned as we get more and more legal gambling we know there's going to be opportunities for people to sort of, I don't know, you know, fudge around the edges here. But aren't you more – don't you think it's safer that we've got oversight and regulation and that it's legal at this point in terms of the outcomes? It, it is safer, uh, but it's also more likely we will, we will see something again. Uh, I, I know we had scandals years ago in various places, but it's hard to believe uh, with money so readily available on college campuses. And, and Braden, you, you're on these campuses. I, I know when I was a student and when you were a student and 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 at every level, students have always gambled. But now it's so easy to gamble. Uh, and and I, it's also so easy to be affected by gambling. But you could maybe get away with it then. You can't. I mean, we saw in the Alabama baseball situation, you can't get away with it for five seconds. So uh, I think the safeguards are there. Um, all right. I want to ask you about, you talked about being a college student, so I'm not going to ask about that, but, but m maybe shortly thereafter, um, when you start working in radio and you kind of figure out what the Paul Feinbaum show is going to be, uh, I'm not going to date, put the date on it, but, but I want to know what the aha moment was for you. In try, terms 30, of, try 30 years ago. <laughs> 30 years. I'd like to know, like we talked to a lot of football coaches and players where that, especially in the NFL, where they have that moment where they realize, okay, I, I've something clicked. I figured it out. I can play this game. I'm confident in my abilities. I'd like to know when you figured out the formula. Like, when was that moment where you figured out the formula that that your product was going to be what it is today? Do you, do you have any idea when that moment was? It, it took a, it took a little while, but but I, let me. I, I know a lot of people want to give me credit for whatever I've done in radio, but nobody has ever had an easier 
start in radio than me for this reason. Just think about this, right? I'm a sports writer who wrote a controversial column. They give me a radio show. I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. And what's this? This is this is now uh, I started radio in 89, 90, somewhere in that. What's the secret sauce to a great radio show? Conflict. What did I do? I pitted Alabama versus Auburn. I mean, I, I know that sounds like I'm, I'm denigrating myself and costing myself some great humanitarian award one day uh, <laughs> as I get old and, and, and maybe once once finally get gray. But the point being, uh, I, I, tr I did the same thing in radio that I was doing as a newspaper columnist, and it worked. Uh, and I, and I, this was not Alabama 2009. This was Alabama mm -hmm. 1990. You, you were uh, eight years, seven, eight years removed from Bear Bryant. Uh, you were 20 years uh, before Saban uh, or, or something or 18 years or 17 years before Saban. I mean, you had uh, you had coaches uh, like like Bill Curry and Mike Dubose uh, and Mike Price and Mike Shua, uh, who I, I got to feast off of uh, in, at Auburn. You, you had Terry Bowden. I mean. Yeah. Terry Bowden, uh, uh, Tommy Tuberville. I mean, I know he's a United States Senator now, but still. Uh, so, I mean, I was able to to pit the – and there was scandal after scandal. Al Auburn got knocked uh, – got uh, way late in 93. Alabama in uh, 95. Alabama again in 2002. I mean, we're not talking about slap on the wrist. We're talking about the, what are the Alabama uh, NCAA sanctions? The the chairman of the committee on infractions looked into a camera and said, uh, "You you came within a whisker of being put out of business." I mean, we 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 considered the death penalty, and I, and you know who was there in Birmingham making uh, a, a reputation and a couple of a couple of bucks off of this? Me. <laughs> so was it so you said you kind of took your column and moved it into the to the radio sphere which i, I again i explain this to people all the time um if you disagree with the host that doesn't matter what matters is the host you you've got an opinion on the host which means right. the host has done his job um which is it, not necessarily the way you now execute the show it's not the way you know when i do regular espn radio on like a on like seven o'clock i've got to create the conflict we've got to create sure. two sides you know, do the whole science of the medium. How has the science of the medium changed as you sort of migrated from not just Birmingham, but into a regional show and then into a national product? You've gone now into television. H how have you, it's sort of a hybrid between podcast and radio. It's not full on radio. H how have you seen your show evolve over those 30 years? It, it, it's evolved to a degree because of the forum has gotten bigger, but, but essentially, Braden, the show is the same. And when I, I, I took this job 10 years ago and I knew what they were saying about me behind my back. I mean, this guy, you know, he's got no television experience. He's got a local yokel radio show. I mean, I, I mean, and the first day I now know because, uh, you know, people are a little more honest after you've been a while. They, <laughs> they were saying in the back room, this guy's never going to make it. Uh, he doesn't understand television. And what I mean by that is the traditional television. Hey, welcome in. Uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, you're like, in the first 15 seconds, you feel like you just went through a, a car wash on, on speed. It, that's not me. Uh, we develop. We, I, I think that the show is now you'll hear people complain. The show's not as good as it used to. Of course not, because uh, we're we're on a conference network where we we do support and cater to. Uh, you've done the show a number, number of times, hosted it and been a guest. We, we our job is to is to help celebrate uh, the 14 member institutions and and. And yeah, to talk about what's happened, but not to just focus uh, ad nauseum on on on, on what, whatever has gone wrong. Although we we do, so it's it's different from that standpoint. But to me, the callers are still the star. The, the show, the, the star. There are no other shows like that because ESPN Radio is not going to allow that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Fox Radio is not going to allow that. Uh, you, you're not you're not going to get a, a big deal on a podcast by by letting. Uh, you know, some former uh, you know, former guy named Legend who who went to jail uh, for murder, uh, you know, be the star of your show. You're, you're not going to be the star. I let a guy named Jim from Tuscaloosa who has just, you know, uh, who's, who's your, 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 your arch enemy. And, if you, and by the way, if you if you ever end up dead, I mean, he's he's we're going to round him up.
<laughs> I'm going to send this clip to my wife before before it gets published. <laughs> um, how, how did you like now you have what I think what I find super interesting is that now you have all these other people listening, though, because SEC Network is so national. You've got it on satellite radio. It's been distributed. And so you've got like Ohio State fans involved, USC fans involved. How have you like you just kind of talked about the 14 team focus and it's certainly an SEC product, a regional product. How have you kind of do, do you think about how to bring in the audience? Is it about now conflict between the South and the rest of the country? Like, how, how does that work? Well, we went on uh, we went on a satellite radio in 2010. I, I thought they were joking when they called uh, my producer, Pat Smith, and said, hey, we want to put your show on the College Sports Network. I mean, I, I could not imagine it. But what did we do quickly? I, I, we started getting calls. Uh, and back then that was that was that was when Sirius XM was it was it was it was it wasn't infant in its infancy, but it was it's a little different than today with pod, the podcasting had not occurred yet. Uh, we actually, we started getting calls from Ohio state, Michigan, Penn state, we had the Sandusky case right after that. And we began pitting the callers against them. Uh, and the sec was on a run back then and still on that run. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was us against the world and not much has really changed. Uh, we, we love nothing better than, uh, a good North versus South food fight on the fine bomb show. <laughs> um, can you, along those lines, and I think Fowler did this rant. I want to say when he was still hosting game day, it was like right after Mississippi and Mississippi state were like number one in the first playoff rankings. And, and there's this, this, this constant ESPN sec bias thing that the committee's trying to put as many sec teams in. I try to remind people that there are more people in Chicago in one city than there are in like most of the sec states. When it comes to like the, 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 the conspiracy theory, wouldn't it make more sense for ESPN to want, and I'm not trying to, to do the two ESPN employee thing here. That's not what I'm trying to do, but like, don't people need to understand that USC, Ohio state, Notre Dame, Penn state, like they would make more money for the network than if Ole Miss and Mississippi state got into the playoff. Uh, I don't know why people don't understand that. There, first of all, <laughs> it, it's, it's no longer really a debate. Uh, the SEC and the ESPN are partners, uh, you know, starting in 24, Nothing's going to change that. But ESPN is a is an international product. And yeah, uh, if you said to ESPN, uh, you know, what's the best possible game you can get? I would say uh, Alabama, Ohio State would be on their, their wish list. Southern Cal in Ohio State, Notre Dame in anyone. Uh, but you, you, don't, you don't want the game you don't want. And we've had, what, three or four times already is Alabama Clemson. I mean, that is, you, you can't get any worse uh, in terms of national reputation. Uh, Alabama Georgia is, uh, is emerging a little bit, but it's, it's not exciting people. And in, in so, I mean, I, we were out there, what, a couple of months ago uh, to the uh, national championship game. I, I, I never saw anyone in, in uh, LA that knew the game was going on. Ever, I mean, nobody, uh, nobody cared about, Georgia and TCU and quite frankly I was covering the game and I didn't much care well I, I think it's interesting um you, you talked you mentioned the Clemson although Alabama Clemson played probably two of the best national championship yeah, games absolutely. you know we, we've ever we've ever seen so um all right well then I guess uh, along those lines uh can anyone in college football on the schedule in the west in the country beat Georgia this year Who, who's the best uh, bet on on paper in your mind yeah, I, I would say Ohio State looks uh, – you know, how many years in a row have I said that? But uh, – Almost did it I, last I year. One of these years I, – I mean, I was looking at – don't ask me why I was doing this. Uh, I feel like I was I was doing something terrible. But I was looking at a mock draft today for 24, and I counted seven, maybe eight Ohio State players in the top 32. Uh, I mean, there were three Alabama players in the top 15, three or four, uh, two or three, four Georgia players, a couple of Southern Cal players. But, I mean, Ohio State just looks like they've got one of their better t talented teams. Now, the, the quarterback is, is an issue. Uh, but beyond that, I, I think Ohio State, is, uh, Southern Cal, I think, I think they are threats. Uh, Georgia is going to be the favorite. Why I believe that something's going to happen to Georgia at the last second, whether it's in the playoffs, probably in the either in the it has to it's going to have to be in the playoffs. Uh, they I don't see them losing in the regular season. So uh, yeah, I mean, it, we watch this too many times. It, it's it's virtually impossible to win three straight. I know that I, I'll let you go here. You've been very gracious with your time. I'm, I know there's a lot of changes coming. I'm a huge fan of getting rid of divisions. I'm a huge fan of the three and six scheduling model that I assume is soon to be announced. Uh, I love I like expansion because it adds value to the middle class in college football throughout the course of the regular season. 
Um, better games is better for everybody. TV partners, fans, ticket sales, uh, local economies, uh, et cetera. But I, I do think you look at where this whole thing is going and you kind of just go, all right, what, what exactly does it all look like in, in the future? And um, it, what, where, where's the next step of, of, of change that's coming? And, and what do fans need to be aware of? I still think what we, we thought we were seeing last July is going to happen eventually. What is that? That's, uh, that's a merging of the super conferences. Uh, at some point, the, the Pac-12 with all these side deals they're working on, I mean, I, I don't see that being sustainable. I think the ACC is in a dangerous position where they are uh, without, without adding some value to the, the product. So I, I, th I think we could still see that. I th it, it, knowing how slowly college football works, uh, it, it may be more than it may be five to 10 years away because yeah. I mean, it takes it takes these people a long time because they have to meet. They have to go out to the uh, to some <laughs> resort in California, and then a resort in Ohio, in uh, in Idaho, and then make sure that they uh, talk about it again in in Colorado, in Colorado Springs before they go uh, to Hilton Head uh, before they decide maybe let's do it again next year. So uh, I, these are not these are in, uh, and and the television deals. For 26 haven't even gone into play yet for the playoffs right but i, I think we'll get there uh, i'll leave it to you i don't think i'll be worried about it too much uh, as i'm rocking my chair uh in my retirement <laughs> home but i'll be i'll be uh, calling Braden to find know. out what, what the latest is you'll still be you'll still be taking calls dude um uh here's my my last one and i'll let you go i promise on this one how can fans get the committee to to take the games away from the bowls H how can we I'm, I'm fine with the semifinal. i'm fine with the final Whatever, but is there any possible way that – is there a phone number? Is there a representative we can call? How do we get – fans do not want neutral site games for the semi – for the quarterfinals. You always hear – How do we get rid of that? Uh, people in politics talk about certain political action groups, whether it's uh, it's the NRA, whether it's it's this group. No no group in all of uh, mankind has a better lobby than the bowl group. And I don't know how they do it either because I've, been, I've I was uh, I spoke a couple of years ago at the bowl meeting, and I mean, you th I mean, it looked didn't look like any of these guys, uh, you know, had a clue. But the, these long relationships, for whatever reason, right? I don't know why, because they don't they're not important to me. Uh, but they are they're, they're not only important to the to the people that run college athletics, but they seem to be important to the people at the television networks uh, because when ESPN uh, looks at the the Rose Bowl. Uh, I mean, I've seen less less uh, honor and respect paid to the Vatican before than I have the Rose Bowl. <laughs> Paul Feinbaum, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Uh, I'll let you get, get to the show, my man. Braden, it was my pleasure. See you soon. Thanks, bud. That was Paul Feinbaum of the Paul Feinbaum Show. We do appreciate his time. Michael, thank you so much for, uh, for jumping on, man. I, I really do appreciate it. And uh, even though you hate Clemson, Florida State, and, and will never give Miami <laughs> any credit for their five national championships or – North Carolina for being the most important product uh, that's not in a conference right now, SEC or Big Ten. Um, even though you don't do any of that, I do appreciate you coming on, man. <laughs> yeah, a great conversation with Paul. Um, sorry, I missed that one. Uh, he, he's a mentor of mine. I've, I've always had a ton of respect for him. And and even he, Braden, I mean, he's sitting here saying it. Nick Saban, what's, what's he doing while Kirby's out here landing Dylan Raiola? He's in <laughs> – what is it? Italy vacationing Italy. or something like, <laughs> come on, man. I mean, this is, this is troubling. He's missing the golf outings down there. Nobody knows where Nick Saban has been. Uh, this is, this is troubling. This is, I'm, I'd be disturbed if I'm an Alabama fan. Uh, wh where can Alabama fans send all of their hate, hate mail slash hate tweets <laughs> slash hate posts? Where can they send them? Yeah, I'm SEC Mike on all the social medias and uh, host of that SEC podcast, highest SEC podcast on Apple, Spotify. We just passed 10,000 on YouTube, so check us out on any of those platforms. Yeah, how is the second best SEC podcast out there doing? How is it doing? <laughs> well, highest rated. I, I, that's yeah, what no, I meant no. to say. Easy, easy. That's, that, that one hurts a little bit right here in the heart. <laughs> uh, no, Michael, thank you for, for jumping on, man. We do appreciate it. Always a pleasure hanging out with you, of course. Uh, get to him on all those different platforms. Basically, you can find him anywhere. SEC Media Days right around the corner. Aaron will be back hanging out with us as well. we still got State of the Unions we're going to do, so stay tuned. A lot of fun stuff left uh, planned for you guys. So uh, always, always, always evolving. We are like Nick Saban. Not of 2023. We are like we are like Nick Saban of 2014 and 15. We are constantly evolving. So we appreciate you guys. Thanks for hanging out. Have a great weekend, everybody. Uh, my name is Braden Gall. This has been Fringe Element here on the 440 Sports Network.